Last time in chapter 19 of Acts, we heard what happened when a riot broke out in Ephesus. Today in chapter 20, we'll hear Paul's emotional address to the Ephesian elders, but there's some important stuff that happens in between. After the riot, Paul sends for the Ephesian believers, encourages them, and then hits the road for Macedonia. He pops in on believers all along the way, encouraging them in their faith, and then continues his encouragement tour all the way to Greece, where he stays for three months. This is hardly a vacation for Paul, as it's during this time that he probably writes two of the many letters he wrote to churches, Romans and Galatians. As he prepares to sail back to Syria, Paul gets wind of a plot by some enemies of the gospel to end his life. So he decides to reroute and head back the way he came. Fortunately, Paul is traveling with his buddy Luke, gospel writer and author of Acts. And when they land in Troas, they meet up with more friends, including Timothy and a slew of guys who aren't topping anybody's biblical baby names list. Sopater, Aristarchus, Secundus, Gaius, Tychicus, and Trophimus. The day before Paul is scheduled to leave town, the group gathers with the local believers for a Sunday service, where Paul ignores both his time clock and his audience's social cues and preaches until midnight. A young man named Eutychus finally hits his limit and nods off, and since he's sitting in a third-story windowsill, promptly falls off the side of the building to his death. Paul pauses in mid-thought, goes down to the street where he takes Eutychus's lifeless body in his arms and tells the concerned onlookers not to worry. Eutychus is alive. As that miraculous flurry of activity has now roused the sleepy crowd, they all head back upstairs to share in the Lord's Supper and enjoy a meal together. And Paul picks right back up with his sermon and preaches until dawn. And that, in a nutshell, is the story between the story. So I just want you to think, anytime that you believe that Jim and I have preached just a little bit too long, we're nowhere close to my namesake, Paul the Apostle. All night preach, somebody dies, he resurrects and goes back and keeps preaching. So we are really pretty good to keep our levels of uh, length about where they are. Glad to be with you for this weekend, glad to be with you for this message, glad to be with you for this series. And to kick off this chapter 20 uh, study today, I want to talk to you first about some books that influence our lives. Over the last several years, millions and millions of Americans have read all sorts of bestsellers about how to make your life just a little bit better. And let me just show three of them to you. Here's one, it's called How Not to Die. I wonder if that might just overpromise a little bit. Uh, subtitle, Discover the Food Scientifically Proven to Prevent and Reverse Disease. I'm good for reverse. I'm good for prevent. However, if they tell me that I have to eat Brussels sprouts daily and that will give me one more year of life, I'll choose to die a year early. So how not to die? That's one book. Here's another one that some people really have read a lot over the last decade or two. I will teach you to be rich. No guilt, no excuses, no BS, just a six-week program that works. Well, I have been pretty poor, and I'm not rich, but I think if I had the choice, I'd prefer to be rich. The problem is, when you read the New Testament, it's clear that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, whereas no doubt the point here is that money is the root of all sorts of happiness. Interesting. Third and final book. Good Vibes, Good Life, How Self-Love is the Key to Unlocking Your Greatness. Let me just point out, this is greatness right here. If I was going to be a superhero, this would be my name. Vex King. I might choose Dax, but that's already taken. So I'll take Vex King. Good vibes, good life, how self-love is the key to unlocking your greatness. Almost makes you think Terrell Owens knew what he was talking about when he said, I love me some me. <laughs> All right, now what do these books <clears throat> and thousands like them have in common? Well, they all appeal to a long life, to a, an indulgent life, and ultimately, if you take it far enough, to a me life. And because these appeals to the me life are in the air we breathe and in the water we drink every single day, they just play like soundtracks in our mind. The loop is an endless loop, and I can promise you from experience, and you already know this, it is a doom loop to keep hearing me, me, me constantly. And eventually we believe it, and eventually then we begin to live it out and we organize our life accordingly. Now, of course, that's a big dilemma for Jesus followers. Here you and I are saying, we want to follow Jesus more than anything in the world. And we say yes to him. But then all of a sudden, we try to fit Jesus into the nooks and crannies of this world that we've already organized around me. You know what I'm talking about? 
Jesus says, follow me, and you'll say, I think there's a space in here somewhere that I don't really care about. Let me just give you that little arena because the rest of this all revolves around me. But the truth is, Jesus is not interested in your or my nooks and crannies, and he's not interested in our little small spaces that we might not have already taken over with the me. He's not really interested in our me life at all. In fact, <laughs> Jesus was born, taught, lived, died, and was raised in order to conquer your me life, in order to defeat it, because all it's ever done is defeat you. And he's done all that so he can live his own life wonderful as it is through all of us. And friends, that is actually the word of God to us today. Die to self so you can live to God. Die to self so you can live to God. Straight from the words of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20. We'll look at the verse that guides us here and all the scripture verses that support it and a personal application of what that means for each one of us. Uh, but first... Let's see what led Paul to say all of this. Our passage today is Acts chapter 20, beginning in about verse 17. I'm going to give you a high-level summary of the story with some key passages, key verses along the way. I just remind you that the year is probably the spring of A.D. 57, 57, A.D. 57. Paul's been a believer now about 25 years. He's at the end of his third missionary journey. <clears throat> And uh, before he goes back to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost in early June of 57, he wants to see the elders at the church in Ephesus one more time and pray for them. Now, here's a map, um, minus all of the topographical things that confuse it. And if, if you'll allow me just to remind you, on this missionary trip, Paul started in Antioch, went to all these cities where he'd already planted churches. He loved to go and encourage churches. As Jim talked about last week, he was in Ephesus for three years and had that big brouhaha about um, people that could not make money any longer because Paul was knocking out their idolatry. He left there and went to each of the cities where he'd planted churches in the past, returned, and on his way back to Jerusalem, he stopped in a little coastal town called Miletus. Now, Miletus is about 40 or 50 miles from Ephesus, and when Paul got there, he said, I'd like all the Ephesian elders just to walk down south and see me and let me hang out with you. And so they gather at Melita so Paul can tell those elders goodbye for the very last time. In fact, he says, you'll never see me again. Now, as we're going to read in just a moment, there's one audience that Paul's speaking to here. They're called elders back in verse 16. Uh, but he's also going to call them here overseers and pastors and shepherds. And I just want you to see that in the early church, uh, leaders had lots of different titles. So, for example, let's look at chapter 20, verse 28. Back in verse 16, it says, to the elders I say... And now he says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God. Let me unpack a couple of these words. Overseer is a political word that is a, somebody who's over a city or over a region. And they simply take care of everything and guide people. That then became a role in the church. Keep watch is the same word as overseer. And then it says, flock, which are sheep, uh, Shepherds, which is the same word as pastor. So you see there's two analogies Paul is using. Someone who leads a group of people in a civic way and someone who in a pastoral setting cares for sheep. And then he calls them elders because most of them would have been older people. So all of those are the very same person, are the very same groups of people, the most mature spiritual leaders in the church. Now, Paul tells them three things when he gathers with them. The first is this. He said, when I was with you, uh, I was persecuted and opposed by enemies of the gospel, yet for three years I preached the whole gospel of the kingdom. The second thing he tells them, he said, the Holy Spirit has told me that my future is dicey and dangerous, and I don't want you to be surprised if I'm killed. In fact, here's what he says to them. <clears throat> and now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. And now, here's the third message. He said, elders, your job is to protect this church from false teachings because they're going to come from outside and from inside. And here's what he writes. He says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you. That's false teachers, people saying anything other than Jesus is Lord. And they will not spare the flock. In other words, they're going to fleece the sheep, lead them in the wrong direction. And even from your own number, liars from within, Men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them, so be on your guard. Now, when Paul finishes this final warning, he says, let's all pray. They kneel down on the beach. They begin to pray, 
And all of the elders cry. There probably have been between 15 and 100 men. They just weep because Paul said, I'll never see you again. And he was their spiritual father. Now, in these final words, Paul made a statement that is the basis of our message today. And it's all about dying to self. I haven't told you that passage yet, but I want to read it to you now. Chapter 20, verse 24. Right in the middle of that passage, Paul says, after he's just mentioned that he's getting ready uh, by the Holy Spirit probably to prepare for death. He says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. How interesting. I consider my life worth nothing to me. He didn't say my life is worth nothing to Jesus who died for me. He says in terms of my life, when I look at it, I'm not worried. When he looks at his plans, his desires, his future, he has died to those things. It's not that he makes no plans and has no desires and doesn't care about his future. It's that he doesn't hold them tight like this. You ever feel like you're doing this with your life? Just holding on so tight? He goes, I've just, I've kind of released it. I, I, it's not my job. I'll live my life as God gives it to me one day at a time, but it is God's job. And so he holds these things so loosely that he simply trusts God for his life. When he says there, I, can, I consider my life worth nothing to me, what he's saying is, really, what happens to me is no big deal. There's only one big deal. And that is that I do what God sent me to do. That's the only big deal, God's call on my life, not my own desires and hopes and wishes. You see, his goal is not safety. His goal is not security. His goal is not ease. His goal is simply doing the will of God no matter what the cost. Now, I think what Paul's doing is really living out two great things from the Gospels. First, Jesus' teaching in the Lord's Prayer. Remember the phrase? He says, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You guys, when we pray that, that's a social prayer for communities and nations in the world. But it's also a very individual, personal prayer. Lord, may your will be done in my life. In other words, I want your will, not mine. That's what Paul's saying here. What happens to me is really of no concern to me. It's totally in God's hands. But Paul's also living out Jesus wrestling in the Garden of Gethsemane with his own desire not to go to the cross, humanly speaking. And you remember Jesus finally said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. That's what Paul's saying here. I have some thoughts, but those really are irrelevant. What's relevant is that I do what God called me to do. Have you ever noticed that there are not many self-help books out there called How to Die to Self? <laughs> Probably wouldn't sell well. But did you know that in the world's bestseller of all time, the Bible, the idea of death to self is found over and over? Let me share with you two other passages from the Apostle Paul and two from the teachings of Jesus so you can see this idea that you and I are called to die to self and live to God. Here are two from Paul. The first is Galatians 2.20, and I'll explain it after I read it. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what he's saying is, when you see Jesus on the cross, he said, you might as well see me superimposed on top of him. Meaning you and I should see ourselves superimposed on top of him. He goes, because I died with Christ. Now he goes on beyond that, and he says, I still have a life to live. My everyday going to work life, my tent making life, my eating a meal life, and my sleeping life. I still have that life. But that life is now all about Jesus living through me. Here's another passage of Paul. This one is from 2 Corinthians 5, 15. He says, Christ died for all. We say, yes. But why? So that all those who live should no longer live for themselves. In other words, die to self. But for him who died for them and was raised again. In other words, we don't live for ourselves. We die to self so that we can live for him. Now you're saying, where did Paul get this? Straight from the words of Jesus. Let's look first at John chapter 12. If you were here for Easter... You remember that Jim Johnson preached on this passage. Here's the heart of Jesus' words right here. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Okay? Die to live. And Jesus is even more clear in Luke chapter 9 where he says this. If any of you wants to be my follower, <clears throat> my disciple, you must give up your own way. That's called dying to yourself, your own way. Take up your cross daily. What does a cross do? A cross is where you go to die. <laughs> and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, and you should just picture these clenched fists hanging on to my life, 
you will lose it. But if you release it and give up your life for my sake, you will save it. That's death to self. It's found throughout scripture. It's just not popular in our culture. Never has been. And I have to ask you, does dying to self sound easy to you or difficult or impossible? Well, from my own personal testimony, it's not easy. I have died to many things that I needed to die to, but there are other things that I have not died to well in most of my life. It is not easy. It's not impossible because by the grace of God, I have died to many things in my life that were ruining my life, and I'm thankful for that. I will just say it's difficult. Dying to self is difficult, and I think there are two big reasons. Here's the first. The world sends a deafening message, and it is the message, me, me, me. Everywhere we go, every book we read, think about the shows that you binge on TV, the movies you watch, the ads you see. The lowest common denominator is always me. Longtime Christian thought leader Charles Colson says it like this. We are living in an uninterrupted march toward self-focus. It's been this way for three or 400 years for sure in the West where all we do is think about how to make me better, me better, me better, tough luck being you. This world sends a deafening message. But it's not just the world. It's something going internal as well. The other reason dying to self is difficult is because our old self has unbridled desires. Let me talk about desires a minute. God has given us, inborn, desires that are normal, healthy, and from the Lord. Eating, drinking, Sex, sleep, work. Those are inborn desires from God. And they are meant to be good reminders. In fact, that's their whole purpose. All of these desires from God are good reminders. So for example, when you're working too hard and you can't keep your head up because you're falling asleep, that's a good reminder, go to sleep. When you're playing too long and forget to eat, stop and go eat. That's a good reminder. That's what God meant it to be. But Satan turns these desires into terrible masters. I think we could probably all tell from our own experience or someone else's when food became a master, when sex became a master, when drink became a master, when work became our master, when sleep became our master. And anytime you and I place these things above God <clears throat> and can't say no to them, and in essence become addicted to them, then they have truly become our Lord. They become our God they become our master, and they are bad, bad kings. So the question is, how can you know if you've bought into the world's message of me? How can you know if your desires are driving you away from Jesus? Well, I'm going to give you some questions to reflect on today. And as you look at these in just a moment, I want you to ask the question, is this me? That's it, just a simple question. Not asking for a raised hand, not asking you to tell your neighbor, just quietly. Is this me? Consider these litmus paper that will go into the liquid and it will either come up one color or the other. It's, that's it. It's either you or it's not you. They're going to come up on the screen one by one. And uh, I invite you to be honest before yourself and before God.
I tried to be honest. I'm confident that four of those are still alive to me and I'm not dead to them. And every yes you gave is a sign that you're struggling to die to self in that area. And yet Jesus says, I want you to die to self. <laughs> Does that phrase sound harsh to you? Die to self. Does that sound unloving? I mean, after all, didn't God create you? Didn't God make you a self? Doesn't God love you deeply? <laughs> so if we're really going to embrace this idea of dying to self so we can live to God, we have to understand what it means. So let's understand what it doesn't mean and what it means. First, what death to self does not mean. The first thing I can guarantee you, it does not mean that God hates you. It does not mean that God hates you. But it could sound like that. You're so pathetic. You're so worthless. God doesn't even care who you are. Might as well let yourself die. God doesn't care. Not at all. God made you in his image. How could God hate anyone created in his own likeness? It's not natural for us to hate our children. After all, your children has your blue eyes or your children has your jawline. <laughs> so we, we don't hate what's made in our likeness. God doesn't hate what's made in his likeness. Beyond that, God sent his only son to die for you. How could God hate someone who is that precious and valuable to him? So clearly death to self does not mean God hates you and wishes you had never been born. But secondly, it doesn't mean that you should hate yourself. Very clearly, you should not hate yourself. When God made you, he made you absolutely unique. Sociologists and anthropologists suggest that to this point, 108 billion humans have lived on the face of the earth. And what's amazing is that you, yes, you, are completely, inexplicably one of a kind. How in the world would God want you to hate yourself? It's more than that. God has given you gifts. He's given you talents. He has meant the world to be better because of you. He has meant for the world to be more just, more kind, more forgiving, and more courageous because of you and your gifts and your abilities. So how in the world could God want you to hate yourself? I know self-hatred is all too common in our world. And I know that self-hatred is leading to anxiety and depression and suicidal ideation and at times even suicide. But let me tell you, that is not gospel. Hating yourself is not gospel. Death to self does not mean you should despise yourself and wish you'd never been born. Okay, so if that's what it doesn't mean, then of course the question is, what does death to self mean? And friends, I think you're going to like this. First, it means you die to your sinful self. And let's be clear here, not to your God-given self that I've just described, but your narcissistic self. Remember Narcissus in Greek mythology? Uh, he was the Greek boy who looked at his reflection in a body of water so long that he became completely useless, good for nothing, because he was so in love with his image. You're saying, okay, well, Paul, if that's the sinful self, that's what I need to die to, what in the world does a sinful self look like? Well, the Apostle Paul went into great detail in Galatians about the sinful self that we need to die to. And here's what he said. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, which in that day meant any sexual expression outside of a covenant marriage. Impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery. I don't know what sorcery looks like today, but there's got to be some weird stuff out there. Hostility, quarreling, wow, sounds like politics and social media these days. Jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. And Paul says those are the things to die to. And then he goes on in just a few verses later, and it's super clear. He says those who belong to Christ Jesus, that's all who have said yes to Jesus and love him, have nailed, crucified the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. That's what we must die to, those things. But there's more. Death to self really means that you stop grasping and start releasing. I've done this several times today, grasping versus releasing. So what do we need to release? <laughs> I love this sentence from the book Life Without Lack. Dallas Willard says, death to self means releasing all our desires, all our reputation, and all the times we want to have our way with other people. Simply everything. Whatever it is that is in your power to control, that you're dying to control, you just release it. God may give it right back to you, but you don't know until you release it. 
In other words, you and I no longer have to go around being completely in charge of our lives and our plans and our goals. Get ready for this word. We can learn to be indifferent. Indifferent to what God does. That's what Paul the apostle meant when he said, my life is worth nothing to me. It's, it's of no significance to me. It is indifferent to me whether I live or whether I die as I go back to Jerusalem. It's just not that big a deal because God's got me. God's holding me. He is not releasing me. It means you hold life loosely. A third thing it means. It means you trust God that life after death to self is the very thing that you were made for. In other words, you trust that if you die to yourself, your new life in Christ will actually be the abundant life that Jesus promised. John Ortberg, California pastor, said it like this. He said, try to hold on to your life, clutch it, center everything around it, and you die every time. But if you die, you will live. And friends, when you and I truly die to self in the name of Jesus so that we might live to God, uh, the most unexpected and surprising things happens. And here it is. Dying to self actually becomes a huge relief. It allows you to go, okay, somebody who knows me better and is stronger than I am and loves me best is in charge. It's not my life. It's his. And friends, this is good news, not bad news. This is great news, not sad news. In fact, I invite you to ask yourself a question today, and here it is. What has my sinful self ever given me? You ever reflected on that? You know, what has my sinful self really ever given me? And if you're not sure, let me go on and tell you the answer. <laughs> Nothing good. Nothing good. It's made you greedy. It's made you lustful. It's made you hateful and proud. How do I know? Because that's what it's done to me. It's made you addicted and selfish. It's left you with a pile of regrets. It has burned bridge after bridge for person that you love. It's made you a shell of the person God intended you to be. Again, nobody says it better than John Orberg here. He says, my old self is killing me anyway. Might as well throw it away so it can die. That sinful self is already making us miserable. It's good news to die to self. Such a relief. But to take another step, it is God's ultimate design for your life. It's really why he made you. Every time you die to self and live to God, you're experiencing true life. Again, the apostle talks about this in Romans chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. He says, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, its demands, its orders, you'll die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. And now you may be saying, All right, but Paul, I have this FOMO, this fear of missing out, that if I really die to self, there are so many things out there that sound fun, and you're telling me I can't do those things? I'll just tell you this, friends. It is the old self that is killing you. It is the new self and only the new self that is life-giving. Which is why I would tell you that dying to self is not scary. It's actually desirable. Because God's will for you is infinitely better than your own will for yourself. And I know this, that many of you already have experienced that and know it to be true. Many of you already know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God's way is so much better than yours. You just need the reminder to die to everything else in your life that is not of God. And so today, to illustrate and understand this at a visceral level, we have a special opportunity to draw close to Christ, the one who died for us, that we might live to God. It's been 20 centuries since Jesus ate his final meal with the 12 on that Thursday night. He told them he was about to die and that his death would establish a new covenant of forgiveness. And he modeled for us how to die to self by releasing his will, by trusting God for everything, and by obeying. And so today we're going to celebrate communion. It's all about Jesus' death. And in this, I invite you to vow to Jesus that you will die to everything in yourself that is not compatible with him for his glory. We will partake in a few moments the method that's called intinction. That is, you will come to the table that's in front of you, pick up the wafer, dip it in one of the two goblets. The clear one is juice, the red one has wine, and then you will eat. And as you pick up the uh, bread, I just want to remind you that there's also, there are also gluten-free crackers, wafers in the center of the table for health reasons. Now, if in your Christian tradition, it's common for you to take the cup and drink of it, we ask you, 
Don't do that today. That's not how we're doing it, right? Here's the rule. Dip, don't drink. It's easy. There's going to be one table set up in front of each of the sections in the room, and the ushers will release you in your section by row. And when your row is released, you'll exit to the right. You'll go to the table. You'll partake, pray, um, and then re-enter your row on the left. And um, here's a picture of it. God loves order, not disorder. So here, here's our best shot of order and not disorder. In fact, our ushers are going to their spots right now, so you'll know who to look for. Uh, if you choose not to partake today because of issues related to health or matters of faith, we invite you to feel free to come to the table with all the people in your row and just stand there quietly and rest in the love of God before you return to your table, uh, to your seat. And now let me read the words that Jesus spoke to the disciples from Matthew 26. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples and said, take this and eat it for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it and gave it to them and said, eat, uh, each of you must drink from it for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Now, we're also going to praise God during this time. And two songs I'm excited about. The first one is called Trisagion. Tri means three. Hagios is the word for holy. And this song dates back 1,500 years, at least one of the most ancient songs in the history of the church. It's all about God's glory and mercy. I think it's just going to lift up your heart as you lift up praise to God. And then a song that Warren's been teaching us the last few weeks, Not I, But Christ. Not I, but through Christ. And it's a modern song that summarizes death to self. Then after you receive communion and go back to your seat, uh, I will come back up to ask you the single most important question of this day. Let's partake.
of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold my hope.
Jesus died really so that we might die, so that we might live. And he wants you to die to yourself. Well, let's be clear, not the wrong things, but the right things. He doesn't want you to die to your created value from God, the gifts and the talents that he has given to you. He doesn't want you to die to your uniqueness and to your belovedness, because friends, you are a child of God, deeply beloved. But he does want you to die to everything that is spoiling his image in you, everything that's hurting others, everything that is harming his reputation in the world. So here's the most important question I can ask you today. What do you need to die to? What do you need to die to? Is it controlling others? If you're not clear on that one, ask the people that you're closest to. Is it envying the abilities and gifts, maybe body shape of others? Is it indulging in your appetites without ever thinking and without ever taming them? Is it obsessing over shopping or spending or saving or investing or return on investment? Listen, if there's anything in my life or your life that is inconsistent with Jesus, that is incompatible with Jesus, die to that. That's what God wants us to die to. I have to be personal with you. Twice this past week, I felt like God spoke to me. Now, my history with the Lord is he doesn't speak audibly. I've asked him to, but he doesn't. This week, it was as close to audible as I've ever had. I almost turned around because I thought it was a voice behind me. The second time, it was not quite that clear, but it was the same message. And here it is. You want to die to that? Of course, my answer was no, but it, he wasn't really asking my opinion. He was letting me know that I needed to die to that. And I won't tell you what it is only because it's not your story, it's mine. But I will tell you generically, it had everything to do with my selfish, insecure desires to be elevated and seen and known. And whatever yours are, I can guarantee that just like mine, they always come from two sources. You do know this, right? Every sin we have comes because we don't trust God with our lives, so we try to take it into our hands, or because we try to be God, because we don't like the way he's doing his job. So that was it. I didn't trust him to take care of me, so I was going to get mine. And I like to be God. And every time you and I don't trust God to actually care for us and to lead us better than we could ever do ourselves. And every time we say, you're doing a pretty lousy job, I think I'd like to be king for a while longer. Both of those lead to sins that we need to die to. And so I ask you today, what do you need to die to? Can you name it in your mind right now? Can you... Do you have a sentence? Do you have a word? Do you have a moment from this past week? Do you know what you need to die to? I'm gonna ask you to give it up in just a moment. Just wanna make sure you have it there and here. And before I lead us in this time of prayer about it, I just wanna give you two words of wisdom. I sometimes tell my daughters that all these wrinkles and these baguettes all mean that I'm old enough to have learned some things. And here are two things I share with you. First, dying to self is not a one-time event. Jesus said, take up your cross daily. It is over and over, but we still offer it fresh again. Second, before you put your head on a pillow tonight, if you really wanna make progress here, I challenge you to speak to one person whom you deeply trust and confide in them about that which you intend to die to because you need their prayers and you need their compassion. So with that in mind, the spiritual exercise of prayer is one that Warren Jacob suggested to me today and it's just perfect. And it is uh, the difference between clenched fists and open hands. So would you pray with me? When you hold on to your life, and your plans and your dreams and your hopes and your ease and your comfort. <laughs> me, me, me. It's just like gripping as tight as you can, never to release anything. So just let me ask you to take your hands. It doesn't matter if they're in front of you or if they're on your lap, just squeeze as tight as you can. And for all of you that have long fingernails, you got to rearrange those fingers so you're not drawing blood, but squeeze tightly so that you feel pressure. Now that is killing you. Whatever you're holding on to is killing you. And if you were to say to God, leave me alone, I want to do it my way, this is your posture. 
and now relax the muscles in your hands. Take a moment now and inhale deeply, then exhale deeply. And open those fingers all the way up, gently. That's called releasing. That's called open hands. And again, whether they're in your lap, on the top of your thighs, or in front of you, or if best thing for you is to raise them high and say, Lord, take this life, let me quit trying to do it my way. That's the posture. As we said at the very beginning today, God's word is die to yourself so that you can live to God. Will you speak to him about that briefly right now? Lord Jesus, we just tell you by faith that it's a pretty wonderful trade when we give up that which is killing us to receive only that which can give us life, your wonderful life, in whose name we pray, amen.